Thank you very much. Good to see a <coughs> nice audience here this evening. We have several visiting, and we appreciate every one of you for being here. 238 still there. We want to study that tonight because it is still there and ask ourselves, does it teach if that baptism is necessary for salvation? Let's quickly think of the setting where we find this verse. Acts 2 and verse 38. Now we know this is the day of Pentecost, beginning in verses 1 to 4. This is a special day. It's the day when the gospel will be presented for the first time in its fullness under the new covenant of Christ. Christ had died some weeks earlier. And now the new covenant is coming to effect. Jesus had said before he ascended into heaven that he wanted his apostles to remain there at Jerusalem. And they are. They're in Jerusalem because he says there, repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name among our nations beginning in Jerusalem. Now the Holy Spirit has just fallen upon the apostles as we recall from our reading. And they're speaking in the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in different tongues they've never studied. As the Spirit gave them utterance, obviously, they're speaking inspired instructions. Peter stands up with the eleven, and he has, first of all, to defend what they're doing because some were confused and wondered how it was they were speaking all these foreign languages being Galileans. And then he moves on to his lesson, and he defends the deity of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the main point. He cites a number of passages in order to make this point, but one of them is from Joel's prophecy, uh, where Joel talked about how this phenomenon would take place in the last days. The very thing they were witnessing of the falling of the Spirit upon the apostles in that great splendid measure, which we could call the baptismal measure, and they're speaking in tongues. And then he moves on to verse 32 of Joel chapter 2, and he says, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's in verse 21. Keep this in mind. A key point, it will recur throughout this chapter, this idea of salvation. Then Peter goes on and he's convicting them of crucifying their Messiah. And he cites Joel 2.32, offering them hope. Yes, you're guilty, but here's the way out. Here's the promise of hope. And they are keenly interested in this. They want to know what it will mean to call upon the name of the Lord. They want to know how they could possibly be saved. We know Peter's concern of salvation throughout this chapter because if you look on in verse 40, after our passage, he's going to return to the theme explicitly. He says, save yourselves from this untoward or perverse generation. So that seems to be his theme throughout. And that's what it was said would be preached. Remission of sins based upon repentance. Luke 24, verse 47. So he's exhorting them to be saved, you see here, right before we get to our passage. Even before and evidently so that they will get baptized. And that's down in verse 39 to 40. And then in verses 41 and 42, it is said that they that gladly received his word were baptized. So Luke is going to continue with this salvation theme on down to verse 47, the narrator, and he says, The Lord added to the church daily such as we're reading said. Salvation is the key point throughout this chapter. Now let's return back to the immediate setting so we can get a handle on verse 38. Peter has just persuaded with them, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. It isn't said in the back. He set forth an array of evidences that were just overwhelming. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were literally pierced to the heart. A very strong word in the original language. It means they had compunction about what they had done. This means they had an anxiety arising from the awareness of their guilt and having slain the Lord of glory. But now, he has already held out the prospect of hope earlier by citing Joel 2.32, the hope of salvation. And they realize they're guilty. And in view of these two things, they cry out, men and brethren, literally in the Greek, or the New American Standard simply says, brethren, what shall we do? Now think about why they're asking that. What shall we do? In view of their being convinced, in view of their guilt, and in view of their wanting to lay hold on this promise of salvation, well, how does Peter the Apostle respond? Does he tell them it's too late? You've already killed the Christ. There's nothing you can do. No, of course not. Does he say, there's nothing you can do, God will do it all? No, he doesn't say that. He's going to give them a direct answer to their immediate question. Men or brethren, what shall we do? And he's going to tell them what they should do. They should do something to be saved. They should do something for forgiveness from that stinging guilt. And this forgiveness can also be described by a Greek term, aphasin, which is translated remission. It's a release. 
a loosening of their sins. This is the way the Greeks thought of forgiveness. And that's what they're seeking after. So they're wanting to know how to get this dismissal of sin. And this is how the word is used here. Peter then tells them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. He could stop right here. And he would have carried the point. Because they're asking what to do to be saved. And he answers, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. But the Holy Spirit realizes, of course, that over the years there may be controversy or questions to come up about this command. What does it mean? So he has Peter to go on and more explicitly tell them what he means when he says that. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, or the old King James says, for the remission, there's that word of facing, of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 38. Now someone wonders, why did he say to them you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? In other contexts, that is told to some people. Well, obviously, we've just seen they were hearing this message. They were hearing the gospel. And when they heard the words, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and they were convicted in their hearts, we understand they obviously believed the message. They believed enough to cry out. They knew what they had done, and they knew they needed salvation. But they would remain in a state of guilt, according to Peter, until they complete two stated conditions in order to get the forgiveness of their sins. He says to repent and be baptized. Those are the two stated conditions. Both repentance and baptism stand between their being in the state of sin, these are the Jews on Pentecost, for example, here, and the remission or forgiveness of their sins. Now this seems to be very clear, but sadly, over the years, a number of efforts have been made to try to get around the plain import of these words. Some have attempted to find a way to get off the hook, as it were, and, and not to believe what these words have to say. We're going to look at some of those tonight and do our very best to be faithful and, and careful in representing what others have said. In fact, we may go overboard to be accurate in presenting what certain ones have said in order to give them a fair hearing since they are not here with us tonight. But we're looking at this point of view out of great respect and, and friendliness toward those who hold a contrary position. It isn't a matter of wanting to start debates or arguing with people. It's a matter of knowing what our Lord tells us to do here before judgment to get ready to meet Him and to be sure that we understand it and that we practice it. In the end, as we say, all the attempts to get around the plain import of the necessity of repentance and baptism in Acts 2.38 fall to the ground. And there are all kinds of techniques and maneuvers they use, but it's still there. It's still there. Well, the first major kind of approach that has been taken over the years to say that, well, Acts 2.38 really isn't suggesting that, for example, baptism is necessary, is to argue that the little preposition for in the phrase for the remission of your sins, which translates to the Greek word ace. Many of us have heard this before. It really means on account of the remission of your sins, or it could be translated because of the remission of your sins. And if that's the case, they would say, then we can see. Peter's telling them they already had their sins remitted, so they just repent and they're baptized, or at least they're baptized, to show that their sins were already remitted. So this is the first major approach. It's called the causal use of the preposition ace, translated for, F-O-R. It's, for example, somebody says he jumped for joy. Well, he jumped not to get joy, but he jumped because he had joy. We use F-O-R, that preposition in English, every day in a causal sense. The question is, can it be so used in Greek, the word that's translated here, the word ace? It's not the word for, it's a different language and a different word. As a matter of fact, it cannot be, and I'm sorry that that has not really stayed on the page there, but um, it creates problems for their theology. It makes Peter, for example, command repentance because of their mission. Says, Notice what he said there to do two things. Ye repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of sins. But if for their mission of sins means because of sins remitted, then he's telling them, in effect, according to that view, that they are to repent because of sins being remitted. And that would make repentance unnecessary, which is a problem, even for those who hold to the view of salvation by faith only without any further acts of obedience. Acts 17.30 makes it clear. God commands all men everywhere to repent. A person can't be justified before God or cannot be saved from past sins if he has not yet repented. But the biggest problem 
is that this word simply will not bear the weight that they try to give it. The word ace, translated for, it cannot mean because of. It does not have a causal sense. It never has a causal sense. Now I realize some would think that's a bold uh, statement to make, and it's going out on a limb. But we're going to go and show some uh, graphic information to demonstrate that point. The arrow of the word ace, the idea in this, and sometimes you see it diagrammed in the Greek books that talk about the original language this way, always points toward the east, as it were. As we think of reading from left to right, we would think, as you're looking at a map, you're going from west to east. It always points toward getting an object not yet procured to obtaining that object. It literally means entrance or penetration into something. And never, ever does ace point back to the west, ever. The word means into. And Mr. Bruce Messner is probably the world's greatest living Greek scholar today. He's not a member of the Church of Christ. And in one of his books on the subject, or, where he deals with the meaning of Greek words, he says a preposition into means into, or rather ace means into. That's what it simply means. If you wonder what does ace mean, it means into. That's what the word means. And he says another authority that it denotes purpose. And they even give this. This is not our paraphrase in Churches of Christ. This is the standard lexicon that's used by all English-speaking persons around the world who want to know what Greek means in English. The lexicon is the dictionary, and that's by Arndt and Gingrich and Bauer and Danker, and it says it is for the remission of sins, and he says, so that sins might be forgiven. Look, there's no purpose in order to. That's what ace means. It means into, to, towards, for, or among, according to the older Thayer's work. He says, metaphorically, that means figuratively, it retains the force of entering into anything. Now keep that in mind. It always retains that force of entering into something. Another translation of it, well, the same idea, it's just another way of putting it, it's by Mould's Ignum book. So with a view to are resulting in. Really, this issue, for those who study this kind of thing all the time in the schools, was laid to rest pretty well. Now, I, I know you hear it a lot today. It comes up in popular discussions. I realize that. But among the scholars, and this thing was laid to rest pretty well in about 1951 to 1952. On our church website, if you go to our Bible studies, you'll see a link to two articles. Uh, well, actually, there's several. There's a series of articles by uh, Manti and Marcus. Ralph Marcus was a, a Jewish scholar. He had no dog in the hunt, as it were, but he was really good in the Greek. In fact, one of the world's experts. J.R. Manti had argued at the time, he set this forth in a scholarly journal, the word ace sometimes has a causal sense. Sometimes means because of. And he set forth a number of different reasons why he believed that. Marcus went back and reviewed it carefully, bit by bit. said, sorry, it, it never did. And it, it, any of his examples he brings up must be understood otherwise. They never do. So that was pretty much laid to rest. Even today, some of, of our friends among, for example, those who teach in the Baptist seminaries like Daniel B. Wallace, whose grammar is one of the standard works used today on the, uh, Greek grammar, uh, for uh, an intermediate Greek grammar. While he does not want to believe baptism is necessary for the remission of sins, when it comes to Acts 2.38, he does every kind of mental gymnastics on earth to get around it, admits, yeah, he says Marcus demonstrated this point. It's indisputable. Now he tries every other way, but he says you can never say ace means pointing backwards. Uh, so here's the reference to Wallace's grammar book. This is pretty well laid to rest. In the Greek New Testament, for the remission of sins in Acts 2.38 is really the same expression in the Greek as in the passage in Matthew 26 and in verse 28, where Jesus, when he's instituted the Lord's Supper, says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for forgiveness of sins is the same phrase in the Greek. Now if somebody says for, and it involves ace, the little preface is, if ace means because of, then it would mean that Jesus would pour out his blood because sins had already been remitted prior to pouring out his blood? Of course not. And because of this and other considerations, many have had to abandon that argument. So Jesus' blood was shed in order to obtain remission of sins. And that's what we understand very clearly. Um, why would the Greek in Acts 2.38 have the very opposite meaning? It's very, the very same phrase, the very same words. Of course, it does not. What about uh, Matthew 3 and verse 11? Someone says, here, it, John says, I indeed baptize you with water. That's ace, repentance, into repentance. Somebody said, that must be because of repentance. In other words, they're alleging, John is saying, because you repented, I baptize you in water. But that's not the understanding of ace. 
ace here does not mean because of. It still retains the original force of into or unto. It means I baptize you into the life that's obligated by repentance or into the amendment of your life. In other words, into the condition that's characterized by a repentant life, a penitent life. It's a metonymy, a figure of speech where the part stands for the whole. And so it is the baptism of John which would put one into a state of condition characterized by con repentance. Also called in other passages conversion, as you can see if you have an opportunity to chase this down in, in detail. In Matthew 12 and verse 41, the record says similarly uh, that the men of men of a repentant act, that is, ace the preaching of Jonah, which means they repented into the penitence required by that preach, required by the content of the lesson that he was preaching. Now, again, it's a metonymy where the preaching stands for the content. And the content stands, of course, by metonymy for the result of it, which would be a changed life. So, the first point is they generally cannot use ace to, to make the point that baptism does not, uh, is not essential or does not lead to salvation. But there's a second kind of argument. It's a lot more subtle. It's to try to say that the grammar of the, the verse, especially in the original Greek, is such that it breaks up the sequence of thought. Now in English it sounds pretty obvious to us. What shall we do, men and brethren? And he says, repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ah, oh, but they would say, in the Greek it's much more complicated than that. It's much more complex. Now some of us have been looking at a debate recently by a very fine example. I hope you can read this up here. And we say this with all respect for this man. He probably has the best presentation of their side of the Baptist point of view. We say that with all respect for our friends of that persuasion that I have ever seen. And I was so taken back by it and, and, and so uh, interested in it. And I thought this would make a good study for us to pursue and to try to be fair with his arguments. Now, in the interest of time, we can't make all the arguments in detail. But he spends about five or six minutes on a video that you can get on the Internet in which from one of his television programs back in early the 1980s, early 80s, he tries to set forth his grammatical argument. So he goes to Acts 2.38 and he says it consists of three clauses. He says, in the Greek, it consists of you repent. And secondly, the other clause is each one of you be baptized. And the third clause is you shall receive uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, these are the independent clauses. Somebody would say, what about the subordinate clauses? In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, he's going to return to those later. But right now, he said the main independent clauses are these. And so he said, now, in the Greek, you have a subject. First of all, ye. Now, by the way, when we use ye, we're using it in the plural. Second person plural. In the South, we say y'all. That's the best way to say it. You all, second person plural. Best thing, better than you guys any day. But <laughs> he is the way that older King James said it. We're going to use that as the reference for you plural, second person plural. Ye says, verb, uh, the verb here he says is repent. And it's second person plural number as well. This, we're going to go through this grammar quickly. It won't bore you, I'm sure. Uh, then he says the next clause is each one of you be baptized. And that's third person singular. And be baptized as third person singular as well. And then the last one is, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, at first he misquotes it. And he says, ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. That's not exactly what it says. So let him come back and he will quote it correctly. So this is his basic argument. Then he says, now, in Greek, the subject and the verb must agree in both person and number. The grammatical person of a subject when it takes a verb, must agree with that verb in both its person, it must be, for example, either masculine or feminine or neuter, and also in, uh, our third, sec first, second, third, rather, and that would be gender, the other, first, second, third, and number, whether it be singular or plural. Now, no one disputes this rule. Of course, that's exactly right. So then he has this very interesting presentation that would blink on and off. We're doing this best we can with PowerPoint, where he says, now the first clause is, ye repent. Actually, this is just one word in the Greek. He ha makes it look like we have two, like we have a subject, ye, then we have the word repent. It's just metanoesate. That's one word. And you pull the verb out, out uh, or the subject out of it. Uh, it's not really, there's no separate subject, but it is the form for y'all, ye, repent, second person, plural. And then he goes down and he looks at the next one and he says, but each one of you be baptized. This is third person singular. But he said, so those can't match up, the artists. So then you have again, ye repent, as we've already seen. And then the last clause, well, it will match up. Ye, second person plural, 
shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he says, this is the way you have to understand it. Ye repent, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that go together. Can we join each one with repent and be baptized? Uh, this is the question before. And then he says, the grammatical subject, each one of you, is third person singular. And it is. And then the subject of be baptized baptized is, is a, the verb uh, it's a passive verb that means uh, third person singular it means to, to be baptized passively and then he goes back and says but repent hmm, that's plural ye repent is second person plural so the numbers don't match up so they can't refer to the same thing and he highlights this in a very interesting kind of way then he quotes from a very famous Baptist scholar one of the great scholars of the world. he said the greatest living Greek scholar at the time Maybe, uh, maybe at the time, but it wouldn't be considered that now is A.T. Robertson, who said this change in the, gra in the grammar marks a break in the thought here that the English translation uh, does not preserve. We're going to find out if that's so or not. Peter says the first thing they should do is make a radical and complete change of heart and life. That's repentance. Then, and this is Anchorbird's words here, then let each one of you be baptized after this change has taken place and the act of baptism will be performed in the name of Jesus Christ. You see the blue screen? This belongs to Anchorbird. We're using, we're taking his charge. We're giving attribution to him when we have the blue screen. For the remission of sins. Now he says the first clause is you repent for the remission of sins. And uh, then he, he wonders now, what about the second clause? Does it go with for the remission of sins? Which, which verb connects up with for the remission of sins? Here's his point. If you say, ye repent, that, that's the plural, for the remission of your sins, which is plural, that would work. But if you say, each one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins, well then, the second part is plural, the first is singular, that won't match up. He's a alleged interesting point. He says, now if it is put with the expression for the remission of sins, each one of you be baptized, then if each one of you be baptized is for the remission of sins, the Neckerberg says, He's not saying repentance is for the remission of sins. And that won't work. We all understand repentance is necessary. So he said that can't be the right option. So he goes back and he says, the second person plural, uh, 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 well actually this is remission of sins at the very top. It's off the screen. Um, the second person plural, and then the first, the first clause says you repent, and then the third clause says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The second person plural, and the second clause is uh, of, of, of that that last third clause. Now he goes back and looks at the second clause and he says, each one of you be baptized. That's third person singular. And he highlights this with his blinking lights and so on. And, and then he quits. Now if we try to ignore the singular and plural words here and connect baptism as the cause of the remission of all their sins, it would read kind of funny. It would literally read this way. Each one of you be baptized for the sins of all of you. Well, of course, we understand I couldn't be baptized for all of your sins. So it says that won't work either. Each one of you be baptized for the remission of the sins of all of you. He argues. And then after he makes that grammatical point, which is really subtle, and in fact we noticed earlier Daniel Wallace, a Baptist scholar who does not believe baptism is necessary, but he says when he looks at this grammatical art, he studied it's an old argument we'll find out. He said, it's very subtle and it's awkward, very awkward, and it's against accepting it. So even the latest scholars on this point do not accept it. Then he moves on to John the Baptist, and he says, the hearers on the day of Pentecost, when they heard repent and be baptized, would have thought of John, and they would have thought it was for the same reason as John's baptism, and it was a baptism witnessing a prior repentance. It was a baptism of repentance. And he says, it's not a uh, repentance of baptism or repentance caused by baptism. I'm not sure what point he's trying to make there because I don't know anybody that ever made that point among our fellowship. He's saying this as the lead-in to his live debate in Chattanooga in 1983. Two members of the Church of Christ were debating two fine Baptist scholars and uh, two, two scholars of our fellowship. And he was the host. But each commercial break he would come back at that time and he would give in his studio later he would edit it the, the video editing, and he would give his own uh, point of view about it and say, I look for this when they say it. So that's what he's doing. That's where he's coming up with some of these arguments. So he says, repent and let you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's some answers to Mr. Ankerberg with all due respect. First of all, the argument is not new. He ignores the context of the question they ask men and brethren, what should we do? We're going to go back and look at these in detail. The Greek grammar does not break up the natural sequence as he says it does. It's still there. 
Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And he also commits a logical fallacy. We'll look at this quickly. The fallacy of composition by trying to argue that he's saying that the proposition which says that you repent for the remission, or rather you are baptized for the remission of sins, means any individual must be baptized on behalf of the sins of all of you. And he really is conceding that the preposition for, or ace, does suggest purpose. Because he says it means repent unto remission of their sins. And that means he's created a major problem for his theology. We don't do this to make fun of him. We do this to show that they cannot, he cannot get around the import of this passage no matter how slick the grammatical argument. I'm sorry, this is off the page. But we find the argument is not new. A Judge Sam Adams, uh, or Edwards rather, back in 1941, submitted some articles to uh, G.C. Brewer that, in, that are now published in Contending for the Faith, in which he made very similar articles. Ellis Ballard, Ballard in the Warren Ballard debate in 1952 in Texas, uh, he was a veteran Baptist debater, a very fine older gentleman at the time who knew the issues backward and forward. He made this very briefly, and as we mentioned, uh, well, I actually hadn't gotten to it enough. Wallace mentions this as one possible interpretation of Greek. Grammar, twisting view that we look at. Secondly, Ankerberg ignores the context in their question. What shall we do? As we explained earlier, salvation is the key thing before us. This is what they want to know about, and this is what Peter's telling them about, what to do to be saved. Peter's giving that answer to them. Them. Peter said unto them, third person plural, who are the them, those who ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? The Greek grammar does not break up the natural sequence, as he says. And this, we're going to make this as clear as we possibly can. Engelberg has a kind of a simplistic diagram by putting ye as subject, to repent as the verb. There is no first clause in the sense of a clause being a group of words. Now, the English translation would be, but in the Greek it's one word, metanoesate. So that's, there's not really a clause in that sense. But we'll allow that for, for the sake of our discussion. And also at the end, by the way, you shall receive when he has that down as the third clause with the subject and the verb. That's also one that lends us that as one verb, the second person plural as well. Now, the biggest problem is, among a few others, big problems, is he leaves out the, prep, or the pronoun humon. Humon. And this word is translated you. It, it's translated y'all. All of you. Uh, we'd say ye. Repent and let every one of you, ye, the plural humon, it's a genitive there uh, of the, in the so-called second. He leaves that part out. And that is a key for understanding that he's got his grammar argument wrong. He doesn't notice the importance of the, the basic questions you ask when interpreting any passage. Who's speaking in the text? Well, it's Peter the Apostle. And to whom is he speaking? He's speaking to them. Who are the them? Anchorfer ignores this. As the narrator goes on to say, Peter said to them, the, the Greek word, altus, third person plural. To whom? To the ones who were pricked in their hearts and said, what shall we do? So Peter tells them, metanoesate, ye repent. This is there, it's actually the second person plural. Does this change of grammatical person mean that suddenly Peter's words are addressing a different group from them? Peter said to them, third person plural. He said, ye repent. Oh, that's got to be somebody else. Of course not. That's the way the grammar breaks down, but conceptually and logically, he's talking to the same people. Luke narrates that he said to them, third person plural, what he said was, ye, second person plural, repent. Uh, but then we have the argument that's made, uh, subject and verb must agree in both person and number. And that's not in dispute. There's no problem in the grammar here in the original Greek. All the verbs and the, and the nouns all link up together. And the pronouns, they all link up together. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is, is the command, repent ye, addressed to the very same persons as be baptized every one of ye for the remission of sin. That's the issue. And we're going to find out, as a matter of fact, yes. Now, again, I already used this a moment ago. Somebody could quibble. Since third person plural is used uh, uh, to say, he said to them, and then he says, you repent. Somebody could say, well, that, that, that's somebody else. Of course not. Logically, we know he's referring to to the same people. But then let's look at his argument. He asks these alternatives. He asks, in his, we noticed this chart earlier, this is Anchorberg's up here. The first clause is, you repent for the mission of sins. Is that the way we look at it? Or he asks, should we translate it, each of you be baptized for the remission of sins? This is a false dichotomy, false alternative. What he has failed to do is to see that this is tied together by the word and. Repent ye and, the Greek is kind. 
And it's a coordinating conjunction. Be baptized, every one of you. He leaves that out altogether from his discussion. Doesn't even notice it. And so, and be baptized, every one of you, shows that there's a false dichotomy he's making there. So, repent is addressed to the group, to them, when Peter said, to them, those who cried out, collectively. Be baptized, every one of you, baptisteto hekastos humon. And that's very important. This is the word for each of you. It's addressed to the very same ones, the same group, but distributively, individually. We're going to get some examples of that in just a moment, how we do that every day in our speech. It is hekastos, every one of you, a second person plural, but it's a part of the genitive. It means every one of you that is part of the, the whole unit of ye. Uh, who are the ye? The same person says the them to whom Peter directs his commands. Ye repent, every one of ye. Every one is the word that grammatically requires the third person. Yes, in grammar, it requires the third person. But it doesn't mean conceptually he's talking to a different group. He's talking to the very same one. It does not change the persons who are being addressed. And we have some other uses like that in the same chapter, by the way. When the Holy Spirit fell on them and they spoke with other language, uh, many cried out, uh, and they were bewildered, Luke says, because they were hearing a kuan, the imperfect. They were hearing each one of them speaking in their own language. But notice now in verse 8, and the crowd asked, and how hear we a kuan? Man, this is the first person, plural, plural, plural. How hear we each, hekastos, the same word, in our, in our dialect, our own language, where we were born. What, is it, what they're doing is simply this, we plural, and then you want to emphasize it in the Greek, each of us. And that's what Luke's doing later when he says, Peter stands up and he says, ye repent, every one of you, or and to be baptized, every one of you. So this is just the emphatic way of saying it in the Greek. Anchorberg fails to see that the two commands are stated in different logic or grammar form, but logically and semantically refer to the same ones, the ones who are addressed to cry out, what shall we do? Well, what about this idea that if, if it connects, if baptism connects before the remission of sins, then each of you must be baptized for the sins of the whole group. And here's this little chart here. Well, that was pretty ingenious. I'll have to give him credit for that. But he commits the logical fallacy of composition. Now, what he's saying is, for the remission of your sins, plural, your sins, modifies the command, let each of you be baptized. If it does, it would mean that each one, each and every element in the class or set, ye, distributively, is baptized for the remission of the sins possessed by the whole set or class, collectively, considered as unit. In other words, that uh, Peter would be saying that, that you be baptized for the sins of all of us. And, and you be baptized for the sins of all of us. And this is his quibble here. And it is the fallacy of composition. Uh, he says it sounds kind of funny to say it that way. Well, the reason it would read kind of funny, as he says, is because first, he ignores the and. Repent ye, and be baptized every one of ye. He ignores that. So that sounds funny when you leave that out. And secondly, because he commits the logical fallacy of composition. And the logic books point out it's an invalid inference that what may be truly predicated of a term distributively may also be predicated of a term collected. A bunch of stuff we don't normally do every day, but we do normally natively reason that way. Uh, it's related to the fallacy of division as well, uh, where you know, there's an improper sort of reasoning from part to the whole, from the whole to the part. It's an equivocation. The speaker reasons fallaciously from the fact about the individual members of the group as a whole. So you can make the same quibble if you wanted to quibble about how Ankerberg sets it up. He says, ye repent for the remission of your sins. One could quibble, ye all repent for the sins of all of you collectively. Again, committing the fallacy of composition. If you say, that's silly. In other words, that all of you be baptized, and when all of you are baptized, you're baptized for the sins of everybody. That's silly. We have so many cases in the Bible, we understand the, the, how the, the logic's involved. For example, 1 Timothy 3, 12 says that, that one woman should be the wife of all the deacons in the given congregation. Is that what it says? It says deacons must be husbands of only one wife. Now, if you commit the same fallacy that Anchorberg did, the fallacy of composition, uh, this is the New American Standard, deacons must be husbands of one wife. Well, then there must be one woman for all the husbands who are the deacons. Obviously not. Here, you are to think of the husbands collectively, and then you have to distribute it for each of those wives. So this is the proper use of collective units and distributed or individual units. Now, outstanding Greek scholars waited on this a long time ago, 
And they said this phrase, for the remission of sins, does connect also with repent ye. And I've got a list of many who have said that. In fact, Henry Cadbury, who was on the Revised Standard Version Committee, says this switch from ye plural to each one of you distributively is better Greek. He says the way it's written here. It's better Greek than just sticking with the ye plural of both verbs. Well, we have common examples. We could use this. The mother says to her children, Come ye, and she uses all the English, Come ye, and be washed every one of you for the cleansing of your hands, and you shall receive the gift of a good meal. Who's she talking to? I don't know. She's asking you to come. I don't know. It's unclear. Uh, she said plural, and then she said, oh, We come, but only, some, only, only one washes his hands. Of course not. We understand what she's saying. A doctor says to a group of patients, Go ye and be bathed, every one of you, for the healing of your infirmities, and ye shall receive the blessings of good health. Um, well, who's supposed to be bathed? Everyone wants to be bathed, but he's not talking to the same group. Some of us go get bathed, some of us go. Obviously not. We understand how this works. And then it was said many years ago by a brother in Christ, well, we may leave out all the technicalities of grammar and the grounds and scruples of philology and the sentence is so plain that a person who doesn't know the parts of speech cannot misunderstand it. It takes an expert, and he says this with all due respect, an expert quiver, a Baptist quiver, to make even able, an illiterate man to misunderstand this passage. And he goes on, and, uh, well, Ankerberg suggests that the Jews understood Peter's command to be baptized in the context of the baptism of John the Baptist. And it, it was for their, now we're moving to the point that he made about uh, their understanding to be John's baptism, or something like it. He says it did not convey salvation. I believe it witnessed it. This is Ankerberg's very words on, on the video. But John's baptism, Baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Base of basin or mation. Luke 3 3, for example. The Jews understood that they were to repent and be baptized uh, by John at, at that time, and that was for the remission of sins. When John was preached, it was essential because the, the scribes or the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized in Luke 7 and verse 30. So that example is not helpful at all to his case. But the bigger problem is this. So think about this. We're going to say this with all due respect and love for our friends of this persuasion. This destroys their plan of salvation, their typical sequence that they have to set up and that they now defend. When you ask them, and they'll tell you in all candor, what must I do to be saved? And they break it down into steps. They might say here, now some would say you get a miraculous faith, but most would say normally you would hear the gospel first. Then you repent of your sins then you have faith in Christ third, and at that point, a faith you're saved. You hear, you repent, you have faith, and you're saved. They must argue this. Now, if somebody says, that's so counterintuitive. Why? Or how would you possibly repent if you haven't yet believed? How would, how would you believe or repent if you're not yet a believer? Well, why would you think you need to do it? Well, it's counterintuitive, but let's just give them this for the sake of argument because they will insist on it in the debates they've had with us, for example, over the years. Uh, see, Ankerberg has remission of sins connected in the reception of the Spirit also with repentance. But the Baptists argue, and, and Ankerberg is a very good, competent Baptist scholar, that repentance precedes faith. So Ankerberg is inadvertently saying they were saved prior to faith. Notice how this happened. Now, if you reverse back and he says, well, no, 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 they were saved at the point when they believed. Well, when did they believe? Well, they believed when they cried out, men and brethren. They believed when they were pricked in their heart. If, if, they, if he says that, then he has a problem that they're not saved when Peter comes along and says, ye repent for the remission of sins. Peter didn't say you already saved. He said, ye repent for the remission of sins. So that would leave out repentance is necessary. If they're saved back up there at the point when they first heard and first cried out and first were pricked in their hearts. So let's notice this a little bit more graphically. Here's the typical order of our good friends and, and our respected colleagues. Hear, repent, believe, and then you're saved. This is the way they would set it up. And uh, this is the way they do that in order to avoid difficulties with the command to repent, for example. Why put repentance before belief? Because if salvation comes at the point of belief only, without any further acts of obedience, it comes before and apart from repentance. Now they recognize that. But repentance is commanded, and it's essential as a condition. There's so many passages that teach it, and they're familiar with those passages. Therefore, repentance in their scheme of things, their understanding, has to come before belief in the order of salvation. For those, anyone who would argue, not just the Baptist friends, but anyone who would argue salvation by faith only. So then have you believe, uh, repent, and then salvation? 
if, if it's this way, as he might be tempted to do to revert back and say they were saved at the point of crying out and being pricked in the heart, then they have a problem with they're being saved when they were told to repent because they were told to repent for their remission of sins into their remission of sins. And let's look at another way they would view it. Ankerberg inverts this order. And he has to to make this argument on the ground here. He says that repent ye is for their remission of sins. But if they're saved at the point of repentance, then they're saved before they believe according to their scheme of things. Because they say you repent first, then you have faith, then you believe. Given their steps of salvation, so obviously could not be saved already without belief. Therefore, this passage destroys our friend's doctrine. Either way they go on it. They might try this. They might say, well, you repent, and then you get salvation, and then you believe. This is Ankerberg's point here. And it won't work. And so, it could be, we, we could go and ask how can he possibly get off the hook. Let's try to help him out and see how he possibly could reason his way out of this. Ankerberg could preserve the Baptist order by saying, okay, on the day of Pentecost, these Jews believed when they were pricked in their heart and thus had faith already. You notice that. But then they could not have been saved by faith only since Peter tells them there's something else they have to do. Because they ask, what shall we do? He says, repent for their mission of sins. At least that. He says at least that. Now, either order they attempt on this one. And even if they tried to dissever baptism from remission of sins, if, baptism, if there were no water in the passage whatsoever, they are ruined on this passage, logically and biblically. If they say, you believe and then you have repentance and then salvation, then salvation is not by belief only. It requires repentance. If they want to reverse that and say, no, you repent first, then you believe and you get salvation, then we've already seen these problems. You get salvation at the point of repentance. Peter said, repent ye repent, and ye shall receive the remission of sins. That's before they believe. So either way they go, this passage is of great difficulty for them. But the biblical order itself never chokes on, on this passage. In Acts 2, through. just consider it just as it reads logic. It's still there, brethren. Hear the gospel. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They believed. And then Peter tells them, you repent and be baptized. What about the confession? You repent in the name of Jesus Christ. The little preposition epi is there, upon the name of Jesus Christ. Many understand that. Maybe to be a veiled reference to the practice of confession because they would confess call, uh, calling his name upon the candidate. So it very well could be the very allusion there to in the act of baptism they would receive a confession for the remission of sins. No problem here with the order. We don't get choked or tripped up on it because it works out beautifully. Acts 2.38 does teach that water baptism is essential. But it's not a work of self-righteousness. It's too late for that. Once we sin, we can never reverse course in the sense of working our way to heaven because the only way I could work my way to heaven is to live sinlessly perfect. If I never make a mistake, at the end, if I never sin at all, God would owe me salvation. As a debt, He would owe it to me. But once I make the first mistake, and I've made many, then it's too late. The wrath of the law comes down upon me. The only way I could be saved is by grace. But it's not unconditional grace. It is conditional. It's a grace that teaches us we're to do certain things. Repent and be baptized. It's not an ordinance of the church. It's not a command of human beings. It is a command of Christ. It is a condition for getting into Him. This is when faith saves. Faith saves when it becomes alive in obedience and completes the commands that are given. Could be tonight you need to obey the gospel. This is a splendid chance for you to do that or confess wrong as a child of God. Whatever your need is, let it be known right now and fall together. We stand and sing the song of invitation.